I want to invite you today to please take your Bible. Go with me to the book of Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. You are going to need a Bible today. There will be things I'm going to say today that are not on the notes and not on the screen. And as you're turning to the book of Colossians chapter 1, let me remind you that all of my notes that I'm preaching today, for the most part, I never put everything in there, but for the most part, they're on our website completely, totally free for you to download so that you can study. All you got to do is go to the bend dot me forward slash notes. Now, I don't know too many preachers on the planet who would give you their preaching notes. And Pastor Brad is here. Pastor Brad will tell you, I get a lot of requests for my notes. And I always give them out to preachers and people. I figure I steal all of it from Jesus. I might as well give it away for free anyhow, right? So I get it from him. I'm regurgitating his information. I feel like I don't need to charge anybody for it. But you need to take advantage of the hundreds, if not thousands of hours worth of research that have went into many of these messages. Now, uh, last uh, Sunday, we started talking about this subject of out of, the wor- out of this world. We started looking at UFOs, UAPs, and all this activity. I shared with you why I believe that it is an angelic activity that is breaking in interdimensionally into our environment. Wednesday night, if you were not here, I taught on dimensions and I talked about interdimensional beings and how there's a physical reality and an immaterial reality. The uh, most scientists don't have a worldview that would encompass both a physical and a non-physical reality. They only focus on a physical reality. I taught you as a Christian, we have a biblical worldview that says you can have both because we know that there is this natural realm that you and I see, but there's also a supernatural realm that you and I cannot necessarily see with our eyes. Wednesday night, I went into that side of the reality and talked about angels in detail. I'm not going to go back and teach all that, so I'm going to run like a wild man through that information to get to one or two uh, pieces of information I want to share today. And then this coming Wednesday night, everybody say Wednesday night. I have uh, asked Pastor Steve to let me teach for a few weeks. I feel really pressed on this. This coming Wednesday night, we will go back in. What I'm going to give you today is nothing compared to what I'm going to talk about Wednesday night. Nothing compared to what I'm going to talk about. All right, Colossians chapter 1, verse number 16. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and earth, that are visible, invisible, whether thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. I had you underline those words, thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers, because that is telling us that everything is created on two levels, the physical world and the spiritual world. We discovered that. So we looked at uh, the invisible realm uh, starting out last Wednesday night. Then we went into looking at the invisible beings. We discovered angels, both good and fallen angels, two different dimensions of angels that are working. working. We talked about what happens in the Scripture when people have encounters with these angels. It is not at all like what most Christendom claims that they experience when they encounter an angel. We have a view of angels that they're these little babies with wings and got little pampers on floating on a crowd, got a harp in their hand, and they're flying along, but that's not ever mentioned in the Scripture. There are lots of different kinds of beings in the realm of the spirit. We looked at that a little bit. I just barely touched on it. And then we went into the order of the invisible realm. And we talked about how God did create or Jesus did create everything in the seen and unseen realm with an order. There's thrones, principalities, powers that are in this unseen realm. So there is a a divine order to it. They are bound by certain orders and they operate within those orders. Um, I'll be honest with you, last night um, after Pam went to bed, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, why do, you, why do you keep pressing me to teach this stuff? I need to get on about doing some other things to teach on stuff that would help grow our church. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me. He said, I'm not asking you to build a church. I'm asking you to raise up an army. And he said, I don't need another church. I need an army to, to arise. And so... Um, So anyway, we talked about the order of the invisible. Today, I want to pick up by looking at Matthew chapter 12, verses 24 through 29. And today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how that invisible world impacts the physical world that we're in. 
and how that there are demonic dynasties, dynasties of evil that are established as beachheads in certain areas and how God wants us as a church to bring the light into the darkness. Matthew chapter 12, verse number 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out devils, but by Elzebub, the prince of devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom, say that out loud, please. Every divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city, say it out loud. Every city. And every house, and every house. divided against itself shall not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come to you. Look at me right here. If you're going to take notes somewhere, I want you to write this down. The proof of the manifestation of the kingdom of God is the expulsion of the demonic. The proof of the manifestation of the kingdom of God is the expulsion of the demonic. You have not really had kingdom manifestation. You have not really had a real powerful move of the Holy Spirit unless wickedness has been expelled from an area or from lives. One of the ways you know the Holy Ghost moves is you see wickedness driven out of people's lives, out of their homes, out of an area, out of a city, right? What we're contending for here at the Bend is not just to have a normal church revival, we're not looking for a feel-good service that makes us all shout, even though we love that and we'll embrace that. What we're looking for is something beyond that. We want God to move so strongly in us that it literally pushes back the forces of darkness in a city, in a state, in a nation. Amen? We need God to do that. And so that is what we're contending for here. This is what Jesus was talking about. He said, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. It is the proof of divine, the manifestation of the power of God. He says, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house? Say that out loud with me. A strong man's house. Spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. Very interesting. Very interesting that you have to bind the strong man before you can take the goods of the house. Um, what I'm about to teach you today, what, what I'm about to even get into I don't know how to do it other than to just give it out. And if it freaks you out, I don't know what to do for you other than to tell you to get your nose out of men's book and get it in God's book and actually discover some things, all right? So I'm just going to lay out the stake of God's Word. I'm going to lay out the difficulty of some of these things, and we're going to just think this morning for a moment. If you want to take a city... All you do is reverse the order found in Matthew chapter 24 here, or 12 verses 24 through 49, these verses we just read. All you do is reverse the order. Every kingdom divided against itself can outstand. Every house or every city, every house. If you want to take a city with darkness, what you do is first divide the house, then it will affect the city, and then bondage will bleed over into the nation. There is an all-out, as it's obvious as the nose in your face, there is an all-out attack on the nuclear family in America, around the world, to destroy family relationships. Because family relationships eventually affect city relationships. City relationships eventually affect national relationships. It is the strategy of the devil to, this has nothing really to do with gender reassignment. It's a byproduct of it. It is, it is what I call a lack of identity in the purpose, the original purpose of God. We get in trouble when we get away from God's original purposes that we were all created to fulfill. We're in trouble. I don't care if that's a human being that gets away from their original purpose and then becomes generally confused or if that's a couple who gets away for their divine purpose as a family or as a nation, it works all the way around. Satan has done a great job at moving in on the family to destroy cities, destroy nations. There are people here from various cities like we are, and they can tell you firsthand of how their city has went down as, as the enemy has attacked the nation. 
The problem is, and everybody listen very carefully, the problem is we constantly attack the symptom. We never deal with the root of the issue. Jesus said, you cannot bind or take a strong man's house lest you first bind the strong man. It would be like this. If I had 10 robbers break into my house, 10 thieves to break into my house, and they were all in different rooms, and they were ransacking my house, and I came in and caught the thieves red-handed, and I saw two of them, and I ran them out of the house, or I shot them or something. I, I apprehended two of the thieves, but I didn't know the other eight were there. And what I didn't know is the two that I apprehended really weren't the boss. But one of those guys is the boss of all the other nine. He tells them what to do. He strategizes. He plans. He plots what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. And so what I do is those eight get away. The boss still is in control. And I think I've succeeded in that I have nabbed two of the ten thieves that have broke into the house. The problem is, if I don't get the strong man, then what he does is goes back and he just mobilizes more troops or individuals to come back to pillage, plunder, and do what they do. This is what we do in the church. I want you to hear me by the Spirit of God today. This is what we do in the church. Lives in our community are totally torn up. They're destroyed. What we do is we go to where the symptoms are the worst. But actually, sometimes where we're going to has nothing to do with the root issue that's causing all of it. So we have a tendency to do something very unwise, and that is to judge by the outward appearance. So we look around here and we see hopelessness, or we see addiction, or we see broken families, or we see... uh, homelessness or whatever that might be, and we immediately think that's what we've got to do, and that's what we've got to do, and something inspires us, said inside of us, stirs us to jump on that issue. What we really need to do is back up and ask the Holy Spirit to show us what is the strong man of our city. What's the strong man in the community? And we need to go after the strong man And if you get the strong man, you get everybody else, and then you can go and plunder the strong man's house. Now, the good news is there is one stronger than the strong man. His name is Jesus. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So I don't care how bad it is in this city. There is one that is stronger than any strong man. The problem is we don't really turn him loose very much. Now, I'm going to give you a scriptural example of this that's going to blow your mind in the book of Matthew, in the book of Luke, and in the book of Mark, there is a story of a boy who is, Jesus comes down off a mountain, this boy is throwing himself into the fire and into the water. He's got a spirit of suicide. Everybody say a spirit of suicide. He's got a spirit of suicide in him. This this spirit of suicide is trying to destroy this boy. He throws him into the water. He throws him into the fire. The Bible says this has been going on since he was a child, that the father said. The man is constantly crying out for help. The scriptures also says in one of those three passages, he goes into convulsions. So he has epileptic seizures, right? So he has a physical ailment. He needs healing. He's got a physical ailment. He's got suicidal tendencies. He's throwing himself in the fire. Epileptic creature, uh, 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 seizures. He is crying out for help. The Bible says he's crying out for help. He can talk. He's crying out for help. He obviously can hear because whenever Jesus speaks to him, he responds. But when Jesus went to set the little boy free, notice Jesus didn't cast out the spirit of suicide. He didn't deal with the issue of sickness and disease. Notice what he does. He cast out a deaf and dumb spirit. Now, the boy can talk, and the boy can hear. So if we go by the symptom, this is so good, y'all ought to pay me extra for this one. This, the boy can hear, the boy can talk. By the symptoms, he has a suicide problem, he has a mental problem. By the symptoms, right, he has a physical issue. 
But Jesus gets beyond all of that and realizes, no, the reason my disciples can't get him healed is they're trying to deal with the small men that are in the house, and they need to go straight to the strong man that is in the house. They did not discern that the strong man was a deaf and dumb spirit. And this is what we do as the church. We deal with the symptoms, right? Deal with the symptoms. And we should. We should try to help homeliness and and children who are struggling. But the real challenge of ministry, whether it's me or Pastor Steve or anybody else in this room, is to get to the root of the issue to route out the strong man that is holding people captive so that we can liberate the house so that it will liberate the city. This is what Jesus was teaching. Now, I'm going to ask you to write a few things down because these are not going to be in my notes. Everything I'm giving you now, none of this is in my notes. Right? Write this down. God cares about land. God cares about territories. We always talk about people being redeemed. But we never talk about redeeming the land. But the Bible talks in terms of redeeming the land. And one of the things we do is we constantly try to redeem the people without also redeeming the land. So we go into an area and we route darkness out of an area. We bring the light of the gospel into it. But as soon as we walk out of it, because we did not redeem the land, the territory is still the same. The spirit is still there. Boys and girls, you can't buy this in a Bible bookstore. I need to write a book on it. God cares about the land. In fact, God cares so much about the land that in the book of Leviticus and in the book of 2 Chronicles um, 36, Leviticus chapter 25, God commands that the land get a sabbatical year. Look here, God cares so much about the land that he says every seventh year, the field is to lay bare. Nobody touch it. The field needs a rest. The land needs a rest. Now look at me. Study your Bible. Do you know how many times the nation of Israel violated that? Seventy times. The nation of Israel violated the land sabbatical 70 times. Do you know what their judgment was? They were carried away into Babylonian captivity and had to suffer there for 70 years for every time they did not understand the power of redeeming the land. Holy Spirit, help us to see. We talk about redeeming people, but God is also into redeeming the land. Now, you will never be fought by the devil to a degree until you go to purchase property. How many of you as husbands and wives know if you can make it through buying land and building a house, you can make it through the tribulation period? Come on, somebody, right? (laughs) It's the truth. When you take territory, everywhere that you set the sole of your foot, I'll give you as an inheritance. When you possess a territory, there are always giants in the land. It has great reward, but it comes with great enemies. Always. God cares about redeeming the land. Again, we focus so much on redeeming people, we never focus on redeeming the land. And listen to me, church. As a result, here's what we do. We deal with the symptoms and we don't deal with the root. So what I'm asking God to do is to give us, everybody say us, Us. not me, but to give us like he did the nation of Israel, a strategy of how to go in and possess the land. And no one person can do it. No one person can do it. There has to be an army of people that rise up and understand 
how dynasties of darknesses move, move into territories and hold the territories captive and then get a word from God on how to expel those dynasties out of the area. Now, write this down. Here's the key to setting the land free. My wife's never heard me teach any of this stuff because I've never felt like I was in a place I could talk about it. Can I give you a key? Set the land free? Write this down. Two words, Logos and Rhema. Write that down, Logos and Rhema. What is Logos? Logos is the total mind, will of God right here in this right here, the book, the Word of God. Everybody say the Word of God. It is the Logos of God. This is the Word of God. But within the Word of God, how many has ever read the Bible and a verse jump off the page into your heart? You ever read that? That's rhema. Rhema is when the Spirit of God breathes on what's written. Illuminates it, makes it come alive into our hearts. The Scripture says that God gave us the law and the prophets. Now, I want to show you what Jesus said about the law and the prophets. It's over in John chapter 5. Everybody get your Bible because this is not going to be on the screen. John chapter 5, verse number 45, John 5, 45. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you. Moses, in whom you have trust... For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, that's the law. How will you believe my words? That's rhema. If you, if you do not believe his writings, Moses, first five books of the Bible, that's the law. How are you going to be, believe my words? That's the rhema. Because all Jesus is doing is Jesus is God in flesh, in manifestation, bringing illumination to what the prophets, the law and the prophets wrote. The key to us setting a territory free is getting the truth of God's word, the full counsel of God's word, which means we can't let, leave anything out. If God did it back then, he's got to still do it today. We can't leave anything out. But we not only just need the Logos, we got to have the Rhema. We got to have God give us sovereign visitations where the Spirit of God comes upon us and says, here's the key to getting the strong man of the house. Because the only way that Jesus the Logos in flesh knew there was a deaf and dumb spirit in that little boy that was causing all of his afflictions was by the power of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit of God illuminated the Logos and said, no, it's not suicide. No, it's not a health issue. His real issue is a deaf and dumb spirit. Now, a deaf and dumb spirit has him under control, and yet he's screaming for help. Right? Are you all with me? Say amen. Amen. I know this is heavy to drop on you, but I'm telling you today, we need this. Now, let's go over here to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I love hearing pages turn. It makes me feel like I'm in old school church. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and let's look at verse 3. You guys know this, but I want to give you a little different look at the passage. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. We need to have some spiritual discernment in our warfare. This is the reason worship is so important, folks. Now, I want to tell you something right now. Look at me. How many of you would like to literally see the miraculous show up? I'm talking about God just in miraculous. You want to see that? I'm going to give you a key, worship. Whenever our worship gets so radical that we move heaven, you're going to see literal, literal manifestations of miracles in front of your eyes. I've seen it for 32 years. I'm not lying about it. I'm telling you it's the fact. The more we break out in worship, the more free we get in worship, 
the more radical God will move. I'm just telling you it's part of it. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. They're mighty in God. What are they mighty for? Why do we have spiritual weapons? I can't hear you guys. To pull down strongholds. Do you know what the, the actual wording there is in the Greek? To demolish. To destroy fortresses. Satan has fortresses all over this city. Certain areas. Satan has fortresses. And God gives us the logos, the word. And then by the spirit of God moves on it with rhema. Along with these other spiritual disciplines, worship and prayer and intercession and fasting and all of that. All of these things in one of them. In one of those weapons, God will activate one of those weapons that will demolish, destroy fortresses of the enemy in your children's life, fortresses of the enemy in your family's life, fortresses of the enemy in our city. Come on, somebody. God wants to demolish them. God don't want to just break them out. God wants to tear the stronghold down so no nobody else can live in it. Right? Spiritual weapons are what do, do that. Let me give you one more passage of Scripture, and then I'm going to make a few comments on this, and then I'm getting ready to pray, and we're going to dismiss, and I'm going to let you go home. I'm giving you just enough to make you hungry for more for Wednesday, right? Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8 and 9 says this, When the Most High apportioned the nations, he divided humankind, he fixed boundaries of the people according to the number of the gods. The Lord's own portion was his people and Jacob his allotted share. Now they're going to keep this up on the screen here. Here's what God is saying in this passage of scripture. When God set the boundaries of nations, people groups, he did it according to supernatural activity. In the ancient world, these gods, which is the right translation, it's actually the word Elohim, these gods, and by the way, the word Elohim is not always used of God the Father. Sometimes it's used of other spiritual entities. Elohim is any kind of spiritual being in the realm of the spirit. So these are angelic beings. When God divided the nations, when he set the boundaries of humankind, there were spiritual beings stationed there. Now, how do I know this? Well, if I read the story of Daniel, in Daniel, I've got a prince of Persia. This isn't the natural prince of Persia. This is a supernatural prince that is over the territory of Persia. His job is to get all of his strong men to plunder the house of Persia. That's his job. He figures out how to invade the systems. He figures out how to invade the schools. He figures out how to invade the politics. So for one purpose, I want to get Persia as lost as I can get Persia. And after him comes the prince of Greece. The prince of Greece is the Grecian Empire. And what is his job? His job is to do the same thing. He's a different entity, and his job is to take all these spiritual forces and to figure out how to invade the territory and to hold the boundaries of that territory captive. So when God said to the children of Israel, I have given you the land of Israel, it is your possession. Everybody say, it's my possession. I've given you the land of Israel. It's your possession. But when you get in that land, do not let them bring false gods back into this land. Because if you do, you give up territory. Now I'm all the way back to the land thing. I know y'all thought I was preaching way out there. I'm coming back to the land issue. Whenever we allow idolatry and false gods and false worship to come into an area, we give up that territory the false gods start setting the boundaries according to their working. But again, 
There's one stronger than the strong man of Cookville. There's one stronger than the strong man of all good. There's one stronger than the strong man of Livingston or Birdtown. There's one stronger than the strong man of Sparta. There is one stronger. His name is Jesus. And he's looking for a body of people who will stand up in that area and say, we are not going to just redeem the people. We're going to redeem the land and set a territory where God's kingdom can be in manifestation on the earth. Let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. He fixes the boundaries according to the numbers of the gods. Now, real quickly, in your notes, I want you to write these things down, and we're going to come back to it Wednesday night. The land becomes polluted by perpetual sin. Perpetual sin. The land becomes polluted. I don't care if it's your personal house, personal land, or it's the city. The land becomes polluted by perpetual sin. I'm going to give you five sins the Bible says causes the land to lose its boundaries. In other words, we give territory to demonic spirits when we let these five sins. The Bible says there are five sins that pollute the land. If we care about the land, we will stop fighting all the little devils and deal with these five we got to deal with these five. So God's got to give us a strategy how to do this in our community. Number one, first sin is idolatry. Write down the scripture, Exodus chapter 34, verses 12 through 16, out beside that scripture. Idolatry pollutes the land. Number two, second sin that pollutes the land is sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. Write this scripture down, Leviticus 18, verses 24 through 30. Sexual immorality. Number three, the third thing that pollutes the land is bloodshed. Bloodshed. Write this down. Numbers chapter 35, verse number 33. Also write down Psalm 106, verse 36 through 39. Bloodshed produces, pollutes the land. We are going to have to reckon with God for all of the innocent babies we've slaughtered. Number four, broken covenants. When Christians have a falling out, we give up territory. Second Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 and 2, broken covenants. Number five, injustice or oppression of any people group. Injustice or oppression of any people group. This is Ezekiel chapter 16. God says those five sins, ladies and gentlemen, pollute the land. And they allow these wicked spirits, these principalities and powers and rulers to come in to take territory from us. And yet God has given us this land. Are y'all with me? God has given us this land. If we lose America... When we stand before God, his finger will be pointing at us, not ours pointing at him. We have slowly given up the land. Now, the good news is we can redeem it. We can redeem the land. We can go into a territory, start implementing the spiritual strategies that God's given us through his word, the basic spiritual strategies of the word, and then the rhemas, the special revelation. So it might be that Trey back there, brother, that Trey, lift your hand. This is a new brother in church. He and his family are from California. It might be that Trey is in church one Sunday, and we're worshiping radically, and all of a sudden, the wind of the Spirit comes in, and the Spirit of God says, Trey, I want you to do this in this area. It might not come through me. It's called the priesthood of the believers, folks. That means all of us have a part to play in this. This is not a, Pastor Shane can't break the curse. But we, as the body of Christ, can take 
territory out of the hands of darkness and bring the light into that territory. We can redeem the land. We can do it. It might be that God speaks to Liz a certain thing or Dee a certain thing or Steve a certain thing or Stephen a certain thing. I don't know who it's going to come through, but here's what I know about God. Every miracle I've ever experienced has come through a relationship. Every miracle. This is the reason, listen, this is the reason the devil hates you to be in good relationships with people because every miracle you ever experience comes through a relationship. He wants to keep you bound by keeping you apart. It's a strategy of the devil. Now, I'm going to just everybody stand up because I'm done. I know I kept you longer than you deserve, but I've never understood why we can go sit four hours at a football game and can't come to church and sit 30 minutes for the word. So not making any apologies for it. I'm not trying to build a church, trying to raise an army. All right, guys, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. Look up here. Ephesians 3, 10 and 11. Going to be the last couple passages. find me there? This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Next verse. Just flow with me. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above. All. Everybody say out all. All. All principalities. And it's implied all power. And it's implied all might. And it's implied all dominion. And it's implied every name that is made. That not only in this age, but also in the age that is to come, in eternity. He put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, even when we were dead in trespasses and sin. This is Ephesians 2. He made us also alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved, and he has raised us up. Everybody say me. He's raised us up together, and he's made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, I wonder what that looks like, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kind toward us in Christ. Sounds exactly the same as Ephesians 1. Basically, here's what Paul is saying. If you've been born again, just how God raised up Jesus and set him in the heavens, and he's above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, he said, when you got saved, Jesus also raised you up and he put you in him far above those same principalities. Don't tell me we can't see miracles. Don't tell me we can't see cancer healed. Don't tell me we can't see the prophetic. Don't tell me God doesn't do the supernatural. I have been raised up principalities and power and might and dominion. I'm going to be victorious because I've been raised up to be victorious, right? So I want every person in this room lift those hands to the Lord. I want you to say this out loud. Say, I thank you, Jesus, that you have made me a winner and not a loser, that I am the head, that I am not the tail that I have the power of God in me and greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. I take my rightful place far above principalities, powers, might and dominion, every name that is named. I have authority over it because Jesus Christ has given me authority over it. So I take my life back. 
I take my family back. I take my home back. I take my city back. I take my nation back. In Jesus' mighty name. Now, if you receive it, say amen and give the Lord a shout in this room. Amen. Now, Wednesday night, we're going to continue this, and we're going to look deeper into all of this, all right? So I hope you're here Wednesday night at 630, and all you young people better be here. Don't forget to go by and see Pastor Steve on your way out at the table. I love you guys. Go have a great week in Jesus Christ.